Ag Pitch has migrated or evolved into a showcase. One of the things that, um, that we discovered was when we do a pitch contest, the best presenter is the one that typically wins. And that best presenter is not always the best idea. Sometimes they are, but sometimes they're not. So today we're trying something different. We're doing a showcase. And we pick four of the best ag innovators, either in the state of Maryland or have facilities in Maryland, to come up here and share their stories with you. And these will be sort of a TED-style talk about what they're trying to accomplish. But Charlotte was adamant. She goes, Andrew, the audience needs to participate. That what you did last time was so much fun. So we've set up a poll here. If you see on the screen, pollev.com slash F3Tech. And if you go there on your phone, you can follow along and comment, vote on the folks that are up here. And everyone's going to be a winner today. Just someone's going to have a little bit more money in their uh, cardboard check than other people will. Uh, but you will determine who those people are and what those amounts are going to be. Can we do a test run first? Can we do a test run? Absolutely. So, ladies and gentlemen, my IT support today is Mike Tilke. You may recognize him from running the Eastern Shore Entrepreneur Center, uh, F3 Tech, and what have you. But today, he's ensuring that all of our IT runs in an appropriate fashion. Everybody needs to get their device and log in. It is poll, E-V, dot com backslash F3 tech. And it's right at the very top of the screen. Or you can also text F3 tech to 22333 and then select A, B, or C. And for those of you pitching today, you may vote for yourselves if you like, or you can vote for someone else. All right, Mike, that's looking pretty good. Uh -oh. Or some, some jokesters, perhaps. <laughs> I think some votes may have changed there. Pollev.com backslash F3Tech. I do want to give a shout out to some of our team here. Um, the chairman of our board, Jenny Rhodes, is here in the back there. Jenny, thank you for coming. Jenny was a judge for Ag Pitch 17, so I appreciate your contributions. And for those of you who watched the video, you'll see Jenny featured prominently in that video. <laughs> there you go. Well, if, if you need money, Tom Truitt is here as well, our CEO, and he'll be one of the ones handing out the check later on, too. So thank you guys for coming out here to support me. I appreciate that. I think we're good, Mike. All right, so um, I asked the, uh, the presenters today to send me their slide decks beforehand so I could have them loaded into the machine or in appropriate fashion. And um, I went to bed, and then this morning I, I checked my email, and uh, Joe Sexton had sent something in at 1.07 a.m. And I said, all right, well, you know, we can make this work. So I do appreciate this. And uh, Joe, I'm going to let you jump up here and talk a little bit about what TerraPulse does. And, and TerraPulse, just so you know here, and for everyone who's recording at home, it's a lowercase t and a capital uh, P there. Uh, Joe was uh, very adamant about suggesting it's that to me. an homage to our coding background. It's called Droopy Camel Case. Um, so is there a way that we can dim the lights? This is, I'm an imagery guy, and this is sub blinding to me. They're over there. But if no, no. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to hold off on the personal introduction. If um, by the time I get to the slide with my face on it, you're still listening, then I've done my job. Um, I'm also not going to spend a lot of time, because I think the morning was devoted to it, um, on the problems um, that we're solving. I think it should be obvious. However, um, I, am, uh, I will tell you that I'm a recently retired professor at the University of Maryland, so let me start with um, three axioms. Number one, land changes. It changes hands, it changes uses, and it just changes. Number two, the rural economy needs to adapt. Um, and in order for adaptation to occur, there has to be a feedback loop between action and information. Um, and that's needed at all levels of society, whether it's governments, businesses, 
um, or just individual people. And better information leads to better decisions. So this is where TerraPulse comes in. In a nutshell, what we do is we take petabytes of satellite imagery, global, long-term, going back to the 1970s, um, at sometimes daily frequency, different wavelengths, different uh, resolutions, um, and we apply machine learning to them to create maps like this. This is global 30 meter resolution percent tree canopy cover. Um, so every location on Earth, we know the percent cover of trees. Um, and we take every image that has ever been recorded um, that is stored by the US government, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, and others. Um, and we, um, up until as, as recently as last week, um, and for any location, whether it's a GPS point or a property parcel boundary, um, we can give you that site-specific information. So the map you're looking at there is um, on near the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Those are loblolly pine plantations at different stages of canopy development. Um, and because we're doing this consistently and automatically through time, um, we can help you detect change. That the green map is um, 2018 canopy cover, and the red is 2010 to 2015 significant canopy losses. Um, we can also mine all the way backward and uh, so that you can analyze trends. The, that bottom uh, time series chart tells me that um, that's an evergreen forest. There's very little um, seasonal amplitude um, until 2013, which corroborates the different imagery. Um, and we can see that it was cleared in 2013. It recovered, got an herbaceous flush, um, and what you're seeing there is the recovery to um, a, not a hardwood forest, but you're seeing a lot of probably sweet gum, et cetera, in the, um, in the, the regrowth. Uh, we supply this information to, uh, um, to governments. This is um, a map we are doing now for the state of Utah. We're taking those satellite images, the um, Idaho, the Utah, Nevada, USGS, Bureau of Land Management, um, Fish and Game Departments are all trying to coordinate large acreages of land for multiple use. So they are collecting, Idaho, for example, is collecting 30,000 GPS points per day from mule deer uh, that we then um, intersect with our satellite imagery to map back out there. That is the historical norm, so we're looking at sort of a climatology, of where you would expect the population density of mule deer to be in the month of December. Um, obvious uh, application is mapping wildlife habitat. Then we can do, we provide this, uh, this essentially we call it a Bloomberg terminal for the biosphere to the government so that they can track change. That was a desert that, and I can't read the date from here, but um, somewhere around, I think, 2009, they poked a hole in the ground, hit groundwater, and planted alfalfa, which is very good for mule deer, by the way. Um, and then the government can close that feedback loop and take action by releasing, relocating, um, adjusting hunter pressure, um, and doing habitat improvements. We're also working with businesses. So I don't know how many people in the room, I'm sure this of all the rooms that I speak in front of, you probably know more than others that in Bethesda, we have the world's largest supplier of uh, wood pellets, biomass energy to European markets. So for Inviva, um, we are taking our forest monitoring capabilities, building a monitoring system for them to monitor the supply chains um, within their, their mill catchments. Um, but because they are a biomass energy company, they also, um, and increasingly with natural resources, they need this social license to operate. Um, so they have the track and trace program, and we help them um, monitor, report, and verify that the suppliers uh, of feedstock to their mills are replanting their forest because their track and trace program um, has a zero net deforestation guarantee. Um, and then down to the individual people um, through apps, uh, navigation apps like OnX Maps, Hunt Stand. Um, 
we, they are, HuntStand in particular is subscribing to our data um, and that right there is a, a logged whitetail harvest in Lanham, Maryland. Um, so that people can connect, learn, and engage with their environment. So if you're still listening, my name is Joe Sexton. I'm the chief scientist of TerraPulse. These are my co-founders. Uh, we all were um, at the University of Maryland. We all retired from our university positions this in June of this year. Um, and this, I'm proud to say, is uh, our first W-2 uh, full-time hire. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Joe. There we go. Mike, um, in terms of the poll, is there anything that people should be doing at this moment in time? Yeah, we'll entertain questions as, as we're polling. Um, who in the audience has a Oh, I see a hand in the air. Let me race over here at the microphone. What other uses do you see coming down that you can utilize this type of, of research and uh, technology in? So uh, part of my problem is I see so many uses. I'm like a kid in the candy shop who makes the candy. Uh, so just to list off a couple of the, the meetings that I've had in the past month or so, um, PG&E in California, they've got a problem with vegetation encroachment in their power line rights of way. Um, and vegetation encroachment number one and invasion of, um, of cheatgrass, for example, flammable species. Um, rather than having field crews go out and monitor um, visually on a schedule, when we know that in, in um, large landscapes, different places, different forests grow at different rates. So we can, instead of having people go on a schedule, we can tell people to go and check on a piece of uh, uh, power line right of way immediately when it shows that, that the vegetation encroachment is happening. Um, another is watershed management. And I uh, didn't have this slide on here, but um, a story in WTOP and um, CNBC that used our data, um, we can monitor when any piece of land converts from field or forest to pavement building. Um, and we can do it over time. So we can watch watersheds develop. Um, so that's a government application for watershed health. Grocery store, um, and I don't understand the marketing enough, but companies that, that plan grocery stores came to us and said, you can tell us when ground is being cleared um, for development. That helps them know where to put a grocery store, for example. Um, yeah. Um, so, well... had hidden slides that answer the questions. So, um, actually, I can, I can talk my way through. Yeah, why don't you so, talk through it? Um, what we're doing in, so 20, we founded in 2014. Um, we completely broke free in 2019, 2020, and, we, and during that time, we've been doing forestry and wildlife and rangeland primarily. Um, in 2020 and beyond, we are moving into um, residential and commercial, the grocery store type of example. Um, and we're moving into finance. So anybody that owns large acreages of land, especially distributed ones where it's cost prohibitive to, to travel and, and monitor them. Um, so um, lending, insurance, insurance companies have come for us for fire and flood risk. Um, uh, bro brokerage, investment. Like that. <laughs> so, so Monica did not mute her siren there to let us know when the 10 minutes was up. So Monica, thank you for the, uh, the audio uh, signal there as well. Um, so Joe, it is always hard being the first one to go at something like this. I really appreciate your volunteering to do that or being thank volunteered you. to do that, I should say. Thanks for having uh, but thank you. Please give a, a warm uh, round of applause for Joe. Um, um, our, our next presentation, for those of you who know me well, um, I am a little bit of a geek when it comes to insects. Um, I am a um, micro livestock farmer. Um, I do have a small mealworm colony that I've kept alive for a couple of years, much to the uh, chagrin of my wife who does not believe bugs should be in the house for any reason other than to 
be squashed or smashed. But um, when I found out about uh, Trina and what OB Post is doing with cricket farming, I was fascinated. And uh, we worked really hard to have her come up here to Maryland to have some sort of presence. And Trina is part of the cohort for F3 Tech, uh, Mike Tilke's uh, uh, incubator accelerator program right now. And um, I'm not going to steal a whole lot of your thunder, but Trina, go for it. Thank you so much, Andrew. And thank you. <clears throat> What's that? I think this is fine, as long as everyone can hear me. Cool, my name is Trina from OvaPost, and we build automation systems for insect farming. Now, believe it or not, when I was a little girl, I had no clue that I was gonna grow up to be an insect farmer. My background is in software and data analysis. In 2015, I sold my first company to Tableau, and after that, I had a team of engineers that I managed in Silicon Valley for a couple of years until I decided to stop squashing bugs and grow them instead. But even before that, I'd been researching insect protein as a side interest, partly because I'm a nerd, and partly because we're facing a huge global protein shortage, and insects are a great way to convert cheap byproducts into protein that we can feed to pit, fish, poultry, and pets. Now, in 2017, I really wasn't quite sure how to get started in this insect space, so I did what anyone would do, and I built an overly elaborate art project called the Entomophotron. It's a 1950s style diner, an edible insect experience station that we took to half a dozen events around the country. We hired entomologists and professional actors to present a menu of interactive edible insect experiences that we used to teach about entomology and strike up conversations about bugs. Here we are at the Dutchess County Fair, presenting our chef special to a robot. Turns out that robots don't like eating insects, who knew? We also had live cockroach races with Madagascar hissing cockroaches. We narrated with a hot pink megaphone. Tyrone the Terrible was our reigning champion. Roach had a thirst for victory. Scarlet loves Tyrone. Now, at the same time that I was making the Entomophotron, I was also a visiting scientist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, where I worked with entomologists and did deep research into the insect protein space. And what I learned from talking with people all over the country and working with these scientists is that there are a lot of misunderstandings around how insect protein fits into our agricultural landscape. So today, I wanna to share some information with you about our six-legged friends and how they can help. So guys, we have a really big problem. There's not enough protein. Agricultural, agriculture already uses a huge share of resources to produce food for people. It's important, but we're already using 24, agriculture accounts for about 24% of greenhouse gas emissions. It uses about 37% of uh, ice-free land, and it accounts for about 70% of our freshwater resources. In addition, shifting weather patterns are expected to reduce agricultural output on average per acre of land. And in 30 years, the Global Resources Institute predicts that we will fall short of making enough food to feed humans. Plus, demand for animal protein is going up, and livestock can be really resource intensive to produce, lots of water. So, crickets are awesome little bioconversion machines. This is Alice. I grew her from the time she was a wee pinhead. She has 30,000 grandchildren, and she's only three months old. They grow so quickly these days. Now, Alice and her grandchildren have a higher protein content with better digestibility of critical amino acids. They're cold-blooded, so they use feed for building body mass instead of generating heat. And they grow quickly in compact spaces, with each female producing hundreds of offspring in weeks. But even with all of these benefits, today insects are not a feasible protein at scale, and that's because labor costs are way too high. Mature industries like poultry have benefited from literally billions of dollars of, in R&D. Um, but insect farming looks pretty much the same now as it did 50 years ago. So that's what we're changing. Over at OvaPost, we build tools and technologies to automate the insect rearing process. We do this through a combination of hardware, software, and biology. This is our team in Florida where we design new technologies and we grow bugs in 10,000 square feet of indoor farming space. And the folks on our team 
are experienced in data analysis, software, hardware, biotech, entomology. We work with folks who can help us with anything from research to funding to compliance. And in Florida, we have a small lab and a dedicated engineering space where we work on breeding, feeding, cleaning, tracking, insect growth optimization, pretty much anything that we need to help cut costs and scale the industry. Now today, we grow three different species of insect and we sell them to the exotic pet market. Think reptile breeders, zoos, bait shops. And most people don't realize this, but cricket farming is not new. Commercial cricket farms have actually existed in the United States since the 1940s first to serve the fish bait market, and then in 93, the industry was forever changed when Jurassic Park was released and it became cool for 12-year-olds to have bearded dragons. So in the last year in this market, we've been growing like crazy, and part of our growth story is actually here in Maryland. So see, in the state of Maryland, we have 1,500 out-of-service poultry barns. And these climate-controlled agricultural spaces represent almost 40 million square feet of unused space. So farmers need new ways to use these spaces. We need more space to grow bugs. So two months ago, we started a pilot facility at an empty poultry barn in Cordova to test whether or not we could convert old poultry barns into large-scale insect rearing spaces. Now, in our first week in Maryland, we shipped 500,000 superworms to customers. This is what a superworm looks like. It's actually the larvae of a darkling beetle. Um, for those of you familiar with mealworms, it's fairly similar, but about four times the size. So right now, we're shipping more than two tons of these larvae from that facility in Cordova that we started a few weeks ago. And so far, in just the first few weeks that we were here, we created three new jobs here in Maryland, and we're just getting started here. But you see, our grand vision is not just to feed bearded dragons. Today, the US market for live feeder insects is a great starting point for early revenue, and it helps us to design and build and validate our rearing technology. But in the future, insects will be used as a replacement for fish meal, which today that's a $9.5 billion market. And today, the global supply of fish meal is at maxed out because we only have so many fish in the sea. Prices are volatile, quality is inconsistent, you never know when a storm is going to come through and wipe out fish in a certain part of the ocean, and that makes it a really dangerous commodity to rely on from year to year. But despite all of that, demand keeps growing. There's a huge need in different parts of the supply chain. High-end retailers, want chicken that eats insects as part of its diet. Ethanol producers want to feed grain byproduct to insects who can convert it into amino acids that are worth four times as much in the livestock feed space. And here in the United States, we actually produce about 44 million tons of grain byproduct every year. Insects love that stuff. And U.S. salmon producers also have new contracts to produce fish meal free salmon in the coming years. And that's driven by consumer demand for eco-friendly products. And right now, fish meal accounts for about 20% of the feed that, that salmon eat. And the best way to replace fish meal is to replace it with insect meal. Now, commercial feed suppliers will switch to insect meal because it's less expensive and more nutritious. And as a nice side benefit, it's also better for the planet. So to recap, I'm Trina with OvaPost. We build automation systems for insect farming. Insects are a great way to convert cheap, cheap byproducts into high quality protein that can help us achieve future food security. Thank you. Well done, Trina. Thank you so much. And one thing that Trina shared with me at a, another presentation was how much war does it take to drown a cricket? Uh, uh, you know, crickets are really excellent at drowning. Uh, it takes about one droplet of water to drown a cricket. It's, uh, and for that reason, we can't just recycle uh, other products that we've used in other parts of agriculture. You can't just take a standard water dish and give it to a cricket. A lot of these systems have to be completely uh, reinvented for the form. Well, that's good. We have time for one question. Anyone in the audience have a bug or insect or entomology-related question? Yes, sir. I will. 
come over here. Is there any future plan for expansion into the direct to human consumption market? Yeah, actually, that's where we started. So when we first started growing insects, that's the market that we were serving. And we were selling food grade frozen crickets that were then being processed into a variety of different products. And there is demand for protein bars and the like. I personally put cricket protein in my oatmeal in the morning or in my smoothies, that kind of thing, a little extra protein kick. But uh, I tend to not talk about it because as soon as you do, uh, I find that people get really caught on the ick factor. How are you going to get humans to eat insects? And the message here really is that it doesn't matter because dogs love eating insects, cats love eating insects, fish love eating insects. Just as mass-produced soy opened new markets for biofuels and soy-based plastics, insects will open new markets in livestock feed, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, biopest management, all kinds of different industries that we didn't even think about that are so far beyond just protein bars. Good. Well, thank you, Trina. We appreciate that. Thank you. How are we doing on the poll there, Mike? We good? Yeah. All right, great. I am very proud to welcome Kelly James to the stage. Um, Kelly's with Macaris, and the first time we met, I said, what does that word mean, and where did it come from? And I'm sure you've got some sort of story to tell there as well. All right, well, thank you. I so appreciate the chance to talk to this group today, and I think that um, one of the reasons I enjoy these types of presentations is because, as we all know, ag and rural development has got, it, we have our share of problems, and this session here is about solutions, and I think that's a lot of what attracts people to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship is that in the face of what sometimes seem to be overwhelming problems, um, we are the community that, that gets to offer solutions and, and tackle the tough challenges. So, so take my presentation in that, uh, in that spirit. So I am the co-founder and CEO of a company called Mercaris. We are a market information service, a market data service. We are also an online trading platform for what are technically called identity preserved ag commodities. I'm gonna spend a lot of time in this presentation talking about organic, uh, but that includes things like non-GMO or high oleic soybeans. It is, they're commodities with a trait, usually that the consumer values that have to be preserved all the way through the supply chain in order to derive that benefit. Um, think of us as kind of like the, a Bloomberg, but for, to let you monitor uh, organic corn and soybeans and wheat as an asset class. All right, so Mercaris is, um, provides everything from, that you need to understand for the upstream part of the supply chain. So for example, think about all the things you're used to having at your fingertips for the conventional ag sector. Uh, acreage reports, yield statistics, trade import-export analysis, and of course, cash market prices. Uh, our customers range along the supply chain. So it's everyone from seed growers and, and fertilizer input providers to farmers, uh, we talk to, we work with grain, uh, grain merchandisers and elevators, CPG companies, uh, and, and even some ag banks and, and insurance companies. And each of those folks along the supply chain needs to know about the micro and macroeconomic fundamentals of organic agriculture uh, and price. So think about, uh, imagine you're a grower, you've decided to take a chance and grow organic corn. What do you price your organic corn at? You can't just look to the Chicago Board of Trade to get a price signal. You can do coffee shop talk, but we provide some rigorous, robust information about where the organic corn market is today and where it might be in the future so that a farmer can make good decisions. Likewise, if you're a CPG company that's producing, let's say, an organic cookie or cracker or other snack food, organic wheat is an important input cost for you, as is the availability of, of the supply of organic wheat. And so we help answer those questions. Our customers are in two large buckets, essentially. Those that are handling organic grains, oil seeds, dairy products directly, and those who don't ever touch the stuff, but their own stakeholders uh, rely on those inputs. So an agricultural bank who's making a decision to lend money to an organic poultry producer who's going to build a new chicken barn, um, not just for insects, but for, for chicken, will need to understand the dynamics of that market to understand if it's a good investment and what potential risks there are. So that's a little bit of an overview of our, uh, of our customers. We produce a lot of this data ourselves. So uh, where possible, we tap into existing data sets. For example, 
Uh, U.S. Customs is where we get a lot of our trade statistics, but there's no place, uh, prior to Mercaris, there was no place where you could go to get organic prices or to understand how many acres in a particular uh, county were organic. And so we have developed our own proprietary methods uh, of collecting that information. At times we work directly with certifiers to pull data out of their records and publish it in an aggregate manner. We also run an electronic survey uh, that has different participants in the supply chain uploading very confidential information into our system where we can aggregate it and, and analyze it and then put, push it back out to the industry. Last but not least, our trading platform is an important source of data to us. So if you asked our customers, why do you trade uh, organic corn on the Mercaris platform, they might say something like, well, it's a way for us to procure inventory, or procure supply, manage inventory. For us, every time someone trades on the platform, that is real-time data that we push out into our reports uh, and give that information back to our customers. The other thing that I think is exciting about what we're doing is that by starting out in these, quote, cash markets, we are building a database that can be used for some very sophisticated risk management products. And again, these are things that the conventional ag industry is used to having. So we have just gotten approval and have launched the first uh, swap contract, the first derivatives contracts, options and swaps for uh, organic grain. This means that you can hedge price risk and price volatility for the first time uh, in these markets. Rather than just hoping that you're going to get $10 for your organic corn you know, six months from now, now you can lock in a $10 price and let the market fluctuate against that price. So that, those are all the things that really good, robust data about the supply chain can make possible. Um, I think a lot of times um, when you go into, one of the reasons I like to think about organic agriculture as an opportunity for a lot of places in rural America, but Maryland in particular, is just think about how you used to walk into a grocery store 30 years ago, um, and you looked at the shelf and you saw milk, and you, your choices were probably whole milk, skim, skim milk, um, low-fat milk. Now, picture that same grocery store aisle with milk. You can still buy that general generic milk, but now you can buy organic milk and grass-fed milk and pea protein milk and on and on and on and on. And the market has segmented itself into all of these niche commodities for the consumer to pick and choose what best meets their need. But all these commodities have the same problems that all commodities have. They might be small, but they have the same volatility risks, they have the same um, ability to procure quality, steady supply risks, and Mercaris works in that space. You can do this for milk, you can do this for coffee, you can do this for chocolate, uh, for cocoa, for eggs. Um, the consumer really has spoken, and that is the, we believe, that is not just the way of the future, but you can see that trend over the past 10 years. Food sales uh, are generally flat, or they grow in line with population. Organic food sales have seen uh, a double-digit double digit growth year-on-year, year, compound annual growth, for the last 15 years. In Maryland, uh, organic agriculture looks uh, a little bit different, um, or there's different opportunities. So uh, we've got right now about 15,000 certified acres of certified organic farmland in the state of Maryland. That's about uh, a little less than 1%. I look at that as room for, room for growth. Uh, that means that's 120, about 120 certified organic operations. Uh, but there's not just the real small mom and pop. Uh, that is always a feature of organic. But think about uh, just down the street, down the road, we've got Purdue Agribusiness, one of the largest broiler chicken suppliers in the world. 20% of their organic of their chicken is, is now organic. They have recognized this as a growth area of the industry and have uh, invested in it in a very big, very significant way. I'll also talk in a minute about what are called organic hotspots, of which Maryland has one, which is Carroll County. This means that the ecosystem in that county has a lot of organic food activity, both uh, on the production side uh, as well as on the consumer side and the, in the middlemen who uh, process it uh, in between. So Maryland's got some opportunities. I think that organic agriculture is a, is is, is actually tailor-made for Maryland. If you think about where, let's just talk about grain production for a moment, the really big farms that are you know, 5,000, 10,000 acres in the Midwest, these are the, the true commodity farms where they're growing a rotation of corn and soybeans every year, and they're really making their money on volume. Very, very small margins, very tough. Uh, farmers are told, uh, you know, you've got to get big or get out. Maryland doesn't have a lot of 10,000 acre farms. We don't really have the land for it. But we do have uh, the ability to do, uh, we've got 400 acre farms and 100 acre farms. And organic farms are extremely profitable um, at this scale. So I would say that for this room, for those of you who are tackling really tough challenges of economic development, 
Maryland is a good place to start. Organic agriculture has a, several benefits, uh, economic, environmental, and social, that are, are worth pursuing, and that organic ag uh, facilitates. So think about the um, economic significance. Our numbers show that premiums for organic grains and, and oil seeds are range from anywhere from one and a half to four times those of conventional. Uh, so corn right now is $3.80. Organic corn is about $9. There are a lot of environmental benefits. Everybody who's concerned about health, the health of the Chesapeake Bay um, should take a hard look at what organic agriculture can do. And then lastly, social. Uh, it attracts younger farmers, it attracts uh, labor back to the land, and it's something that, uh, that kind of checks the boxes for, for a lot of things that are needed to foster all of the good work that the, those in the room are, are doing, whether you're looking at healthcare, whether you're looking at employment, whether you're looking at you know, environmental sustainability, or whether you're simply looking to raise uh, incomes. So I'll conclude there, but hopefully there are some good questions, and I will be here after to, to continue the dialogue. Thank you very much. And we do have time for one question, should someone have a question. Well, Kelly, the question I do have is, where did the name come from? Uh, well, Mercaris is a, has, naming something is not, not easy. There are a lot of names that are, are taken, but Mercaris is based on two Latin words for trading uh, and markets. So that's how we came up with the name. Very appropriate, isn't right. it? Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much, thanks. Kelly. I appreciate that. All right, well, for those of you who were at the Grow and Fortify conference last year, and I think I saw Mr. Addicts make a, um, a quick goodbye there quietly, um, we had our Ag Pitch 18, and we had several really fantastic entrepreneurs get up and talk about their, um, their companies and what they were going to do, and Tom Moraine was the winner of that uh, contest. Mr. Tilke, is there something that I need there? Oh, I'm sorry. I will speak a little more slowly. So uh, Tom Moraine was the, uh, the grand prize winner for Ag Pitch 18. And for those of you who haven't seen the video, I encourage you to go to YouTube and do a search for Ag Pitch uh, 18. And, and you can see Tom up there grabbing the big cardboard check and all the applause for him and, and what have you. And I'm excited to hear what your company's done since uh, we had the Ag Pitch 18. And as we wrap up this survey, and I want to make sure I get my answer in as well, um, we will switch over to your slides. So make sure you guys get your poll in there if you hadn't already. What do you think, Mike? Okay. We good? Yeah, we're getting, getting started. Alrighty. Well, it's nice to be it's nice to be here, everybody. I'm here today because the younger people in the company would not let me fly drones today. So <laughs> I was a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and a Marine Corps aviator. Um, I, my son actually incepted this company. Somebody have the clicker? Here we go. What's up? I uh, see. No, it's the left right. Left right. There we go. So we, can get, we deliver modern agronomy services, which is we use drones, we use artificial intelligence software, we use laboratory analysis, we provide these services, and we tell farmers exactly what they need to do, where they need to do it, how they need to do it, and we give them shape files that will run all their equipment while it's doing it, freeing up the farmer for probably 25% of their time, Increasing yields 10% or greater, we've seen 30% in some fields. The average farm field that we're seeing in Maryland, if you grade them from A to F, is probably a C minus if you compare it to what is the optimal plant that can be grown. And we're able to tell plant by plant with our drones from starting with a field scouting then we go in and we tell them historical data. That's what they're using right now. That's the big problem. They don't change. Every year they use historical data. They start, they spread the same amounts of fertilizer. But what we do is we show them exactly where they need to put less, where they need to put more, where they have infestations, and we tell them exactly what needs to be done and what amounts. We actually give them the prescriptions for their farms. 
the net result is, is that we also are able to show them with our drones, plant by plant, we can actually tell them what's going on in the chlorophyll with their plant. If a bug bites a leaf on a plant, it changes the chlorophyll in their plant. And that's causes stress. So we can actually catch plants pre-disease so the farmer can actually take action that will save the crop. Typically, we, we launch our drones. They'll do anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 acres in a day. Uh, to give you an idea of what that is, it would take a human to scout four acres an hour. So this is about a thousand times more accurate. It's a thousand times more efficient. And our drone sensors are 4,000 times to 5,000 times more accurate than a satellite picture. And so we really can see a bug smiling on a leaf if you want to look at it. We were the winners of Ag Pitch, and that was, I have to thank uh, Tom Pruitt and, and Andrew for sponsoring these events because it gave us the confidence to move forward. Where we are right now today is that we are entering, we have subscriptions from farmers uh, that will cover all our overheads. They've seen the need, they've seen the results. We have letters from farmers saying that we've increased their, um, made it possible for them to have a ninth 10th generation. I loved hearing about the organic farms. We have software to help the small organic farms because they have a real need for, actually they have more intense need for data because they're not using harsher chemicals. They have to actually stay ahead of it. So we're able to tell them exactly what they need as well. Our team, why are we successful? I think one of the top things we have gender equity in our management team. Our management team is 50-50 men and women, and our labor force is managed 60-40. We also are able to hire high school graduates from the rural sectors, teach them how to fly drones, train them, and put them to work. As we go into 2020, we are also developing new R&D. I believe MadTech is going to be to agriculture what fracking was to the oil and gas industry. In Europe, using the, art, the this kind of software, we've taken it to another level, using this kind of data from drones, putting boots on the ground. We don't just pass information off. We give the farmer complete information, complete solutions. He doesn't have to do anything except implement what we tell him to do. And if he wants us to implement it for him, we will. And scouting, sending someone to the center of a, you know, today scouting the way they m manage their farms is typically, you know, if you had a 500 acre field, somebody would stop by and look on the outside. They might go 10, 20 feet into it. But the, the problem's in the center of the field. You got to send someone in and you got to know where it is. And they got to have a GPS device to look at it. The other really good thing going into 2020 is that our land survey for environmental protection is our next big generation. It's actually turned out to be 35% of our revenues this year. We can literally show you where every drop of water will flow on a field or on a property. And what that means is as we reduce, increase yields, we also decrease the amount of fertilizer. I know it sounds crazy, but that's what it, we do. 10% more yield, 30% less fertilizer. Imagine what that does for the Chesapeake Bay. And for environmental contraction, you've got these agricultural industrial sites. You have, you know, they're trying to monitor all the runoff from their property. And we show them where, where it's going, where it shouldn't be going. And as a result, we're able to uh, allow them to comply environmentally. The accuracy of these maps, to give you an idea, we did 1,000 acres for a Fortune 500 company that had very concerns about where things were flowing. If they'd had a survey team go out there and do this work, it would have taken them a month. We did it in four days. We did it much more accurately using photogrammetry engineering, which is accurate to half an inch. We can show them contours. We can actually take the vegetation off the land and show them what it would look like underneath it if it wasn't there. So we're providing disruptive technology 
that I believe is going to change the way agriculture does business going forward. And uh, we've been profitable since 2017, and now we're going into 2020. We have partnerships with Israelis now. Companies have, are actually partnering with us. They want to give us money to uh, for our technologies and to expand our technologies. We also are getting um, long-term subscriptions that make it possible for us to hire more people because all our overheads are covered. We're at 1.5 times revenue for over overheads. So we have a really good product, we have a good service, and we intend to make the best of it with our folks. I would say one of the keys to our success, I think that's important to talk about that. We did work with, as we said, with Farm Credit, has been a real confidence builder with us. Tedco has helped us, and Balduzzi back there. Um, and we also, um, the Salisbury University had a hatchery. So these competitions are very important to small companies like ours because it helps us become big companies. And we just keep, we take opportunities. We're optimistic, as the, one of the speakers said this morning, and we just keep taking one more chance, one more chance like the Star Wars movie. <laughs> and uh, it's all good. So with that, I know we do, we're doing so much stuff, it's kind of crazy, but we're, uh, and I want to compliment all the people that went before me. They represented themselves very well, and I'm very interested in, in actually associating with them going forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tom. And Tom, I really have to applaud you as well for not coughing at all. Tom's coming off with pneumonia, so I was surprised that I didn't hear a single cough, but... Um, Justin, our IT expert here with RMC, and for those of you who don't know, you can't spell Justin without IT, so thank you very much. He had a laugh track queued up, so if Tom had gone into a coughing fit, we were going to overlay with I a little know, bit I of appreciate uh, it. laughter or clapping I or think coughing I was a little bit along off with you. Um, and we have time for one question, should someone put a hand in the air? Well, I think we're good then. All right. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. There was... Yes, we have a subscription model now that is uh, where farmers will are paying us on average $28 an acre for a 12-month subscription. We also have Fortune 500 companies now that are giving us subscriptions for doing all their environmental compliance work, which is providing them the necessary documentation to prove that they aren't contaminating, that things are running off where they're supposed to be running off. We're doing volumetrics on lagoons for waste. Um, and that's where our, our, our heart of our company is agriculture and environmental compliance, and we're going to stay in that lane because we, we love it and we have a great team. I'm the oldest guy in the company. I have to compliment. One of the other best things that happened to us because of Ag Pitch was Farm Credit introduced me, Monica, stand up, introduced me to our chief operating officer. And she has been, we are the uh, two oldest people in the company, and I'm way older than she is, so, but... <laughs> Everyone else is under 23, and we're looking to, we open a corporate office in Salisbury, and we're opening offices all over the state now, and internationally. We're going with Israel. We're going to Israel and, and uh, doing that, and Denver, and now Boston. So we're growing. It works. Well, that's fantastic. It's nice to hear these success stories coming out of events like this. So thank you again, Tom. We appreciate that. <laughs> so I guess now is the time where we cue the lights. For those of you who are sleeping, you might want to wake up right now. Your work here is done. Um, so we will take about two minutes to write these big cardboard checks out, and then Mr. Truitt shall come up here. Well, come on up here. Everyone's all assembled. They've been waiting breathlessly. And this is our CEO, Tom Truitt, Farm Credit. So, ladies and gentlemen, based on your votes here, we would like to recognize the Ag Showcase 19 winner as Obi Post. Trina, come on up here. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. And, Charles <laughs> Franchu, thank you very much for walking on stage into, you just didn't know what you were going to be walking into here, too. So we have a couple of the checks here as well. Um, Joe Sexton of TerraPulse, would you like to come up here and take your check to the, uh, the bank with you?
All right, excellent. And then uh, Kelly James, come on up here. Mayor Karras, the wonderful Latin word. Thank you very much. And then lastly, Ag Pitch 18 winner, Tom Moraine. Monica, would you like to come up here as well? No, I'm not going to take Oh, okay. <laughs> then Tom Moraine, come on up here. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for attending this event. Uh, we plan to have this next year at the Grow and Fortify Conference.